Hey guys, Bailey Hancock here. Welcome back. So my guest today is, we call each other brother and sister. Yeah, um, we do. Yeah, and that's primarily because from the moment we met, we were like, whoa, I like this person. But like, not like, like, not like, 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 like circle no on the do you like me, yes I, or no. I was attracted to you. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. But sure, that's- but then the moment, I feel like the moment we got to know each other, we're like, yeah, no, this is going to be a brother sister thing. And mm-hmm. then it's pretty much just been the, the best thing ever. So we're on seven years now. Yeah. At one point, we both had the exact same car, the Honda Fit 2010. We did. Henning had the copper version. I we had call the black. It burnt umber. Oh, in- burnt oh, umber. Yeah. Um, yeah. My apologies. I'm so sorry. Burnt umber. And I had just the regular old black. Her name was Pepper. Mm-hmm. Um, did yours Mine's have a big name? zippy? Oh, I still own mine. I have not uh, upgraded to a more sophisticated model of car. Okay, baby steps, Henning. Baby it's a steps. journey. So you guys will hear all about it soon. <laughs> so I guess I should introduce you. So this is Henning Fogue. He is a writer assistant on writer's assistant on a network TV show. We'll keep it, you know, we don't need to talk about that. Like you could be on something else by the time this airs. He's moving and shaking, you guys. Yeah, no, I sign NDAs for this stuff. It's a it's a sitcom <laughs> specifically. We can we can be clear that it is a comedy. I am a melodramatic person, but I work in a comedic world. I can completely back that up. Mm -hmm. So I wanted Henning on today because I have not, I've been there for Henning's career journey or situation as I like to call it for the last seven years. And so I've got a, I've had a front row seat to watching him go from, I mean, you moved here to LA, what, three months before me early or late 2010. Yep. October, 2010. So Henning moved here from New York in October, 2010. And I got here on January 30th, 2010 right before New Year's Eve. So we kind of both kicked off 2011 in these totally weird places in this foreign city where we each knew like one to two people and Mm -hmm. thought we knew what we wanted to do with our lives. And then ha 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 ha, seven years later, we're both finally getting there. So I'm excited to have everybody hear uh, how you got to where you are today and all of the things that happened along the way. So let's start at the beginning. Okay. You went to Columbia. Uh huh. I went to Columbia College in New York for film studies and creative writing. I graduated in 2008. Um, I should clarify. So I am a writer, aspiring writer. The program that I did was more film analysis, education, sort of like, you know, sitting in a dark room, you know, framing the screen and and asking. Oh, artsy shit. Artsy shit. It was an artsy shit education. (laughs) And I, I value it tremendously. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I think that it lends me a slightly unique perspective out here in the sea of white cis hetero dudes. Um, but can I say that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, this cool. is my show. What I am. I'm just telling my truth. Guys. Also, for those of you not watching, Henning is all of those things. <laughs> white cis hetero dude. <laughs> uh, anyway, so film studies education. I, I knew probably halfway through college that I wanted to write, that that was sort of the thing. When you grow up, you know, when you're when you're drawn to entertainment, you start off, every kid wants to be an actor. I think I assumed right. it was step day, one. I, step one. I'd be the next Batman. You realize around Which Batman. Well, I was gonna follow Val Kilmer. Okay. And Batman and Robin had not yet come out. So Thank God. in my mind there was only Michael Keaton and Val Kilmer. And I assumed I could take the mantle next. Um, then you quickly realize that you have no discernible acting talent. And then you pivot and you say, oh, well, maybe, you know, I should be a director. Directors have more control. They're the storytellers. I'm going to be Steven Spielberg. I've seen Jurassic Park. That seems like a viable. Good enough. Yeah. Um, You realize in late high school, you're not so good at corralling people. Uh, And so that path is sort of done. I've always written. I think that that's always sort of been a part of my makeup. I feel the most comfortable writing. I feel like the most... Uh, complete version of myself when I'm putting stuff on the page. This conversation is deeply uncomfortable. For me <laughs> I have a pen right here just to kind of just just in a case. blanket. I'll put this right here just to give you guys a sense. This is what I look like most days. I've got a pen in my ear. There's no earbuds. There is a plaid shirt. I fit the profile always, of a yeah. writer's assistant. Los You've Angeles. got a beard at the moment. I have a beard at the moment. I'll shave this tomorrow. I'm mercurial. I change things on a whim. <laughs> Again, this is like a preview for all of the wonderful uh, human qualities we're going to discuss today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so writing sort of came into focus in college. And, and I think from then until maybe even like 2010, 2011, it was this sort of ambiguous sense like, oh, I'm a writer. I'm pretty good at this, so I should do this. I'm not sure that I committed to actually doing something 
about it in the sense that I was writing a lot of stuff. I've, I've had a blog, liftingfogblog.com for the last nine years now. Which it's I a delight for, for those of you who have, who have never read it, but you will. We'll put it in the show notes. Sure. Yeah. Got to plug that shit. <laughs> uh, um, sorry. I need to speed through this. Suffice it to say, I've had writing outlets, but I think that I've always actually hesitated to dive into the thing that I proclaim to want, which is specifically television writing. And it's only in the last year and a half now, almost two years, that I have been pursuing a more professional track uh, along the writer's assistant lines, really being in a room and kind of going about it that way. Before you write, you have survival jobs, you sort of, you know, navigate the world as best you can, but it's also in hindsight, sort of an easy um, smokescreen for actually doing the thing that you proclaim to want to do. So if I were to sum up the last seven years, it's some, you know, uh, some, some matter of reconciling sort of expectations with reality, something along those terms. I don't yeah. know. And those, that, so those seven years are what I really want to talk about. And yeah. I will say you're totally right on. Like, I think when people have, a career dream like writing. It seems to be writers in particular seem to be the most tortured among <laughs> people in, in entertainment, even more so than actors. Perhaps this is because an ex-boyfriend is a writer and I have a, a, a unique <laughs> spin on how I feel about sure, that career yeah. path. However, um, you're right. I think when, when, especially when you move out to LA with the dream of doing that thing in mind, it's so easy to get here or anywhere really and do other smaller jobs that mm -hmm. you can justify as well, you know, got to pay the rent, which absolutely, of course you do. But we all know that sometimes doing those jobs over actually putting in the work and getting in the industry in which you're trying to work in is another form of procrastination in a way. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I, yeah. I've done that time and time again. So I speak from experience, but yeah, Henning and I both have that in common. We are very good procrastinators because when we procrastinate, we are productive as hell and we get shit done. <laughs> And it makes it look like we know what we're doing. <laughs> well, I think we're, we're both storytellers. It manifests itself in different ways for both of us. We are people who are drawn to narratives, who are drawn to beginnings, middles, and ends. And I think that moving out here to Hollywood, everybody that moves to, to Los Angeles, Hollywood, for the most part, is animated by a certain kind of idealistic impulse, which is great. And I, I think that's something everybody needs to kind of hold on to and harness. But the the... The downside to that, you know, the, the kind of curse end of it is that you have these ideas as to how things are going to go. And sometimes, especially if you're a stubborn person, which you are, which I am, you don't allow reality to kind of seep in and, and you have a, a very regimented, rigid idea as to kind of how it's going to go. And anything that doesn't jive with that, you know, you kind of, you shunt it aside. You're not, you're not really comfortable letting that in. Um, I think that's also something to do with being in your 20s. Yeah. There's that sense of like, oh, yeah, no, but I can do it. Like, it'll be different. I can control mm -hmm. this situation. If I work really hard, it'll all come through. And yeah, that's a tough lesson to learn. Like, hard work doesn't always equal success, at least not right away. For some yeah. people, it does. But I think there's a lot of luck involved in that. And there's a lot of other variables you're just not privy to when you're in your 20s. But as you get older, you start to see the bigger picture. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I see why that didn't work out or you know, I needed to be more flexible over here when I wasn't. So, right. I was like, you know, you get so wrapped up in the romance of it. And I've certainly felt this way about a lot of the, I call them survival jobs, you know, being a barista, a bookseller, dog walker, tutor, part time teacher at a charter school in San Pedro. I think I'm the only person. I forgot about that one. Oh, yeah. No, that was a great one. I think I'm the only uh, teacher to have ever shown a, a group of, of kids Rushmore when I was supposed to be teaching them about college prep. <laughs> I think that's a very fair lesson plan. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I was not a good teacher, and I apologize to all the students from Colas <laughs> uh, in 2012. Uh, they're fine now. Everybody's great. But, but within those jobs, I think that it's easy, to, it's easy to think, oh, yeah, like I'm roughing it now. I'm just like doing it because, at least in my case, you know, you sort of you have these heroes, you know, these literary heroes, these, these Hollywood heroes, and you read about their stories like coming up and just struggling and surviving, and there's something that seems very poetic about that lost in that or at least unsaid in a lot of those stories is like they were working their asses off to pursue their shit you know while they were doing these other things so it's one thing to be an underpaid barnes and noble bookseller and it's another to actually be writing while you're doing it it's like i think i got half of the equation right and it took me 
You got the struggle part, right? I got the struggle part. I we both that were so early. good at struggling. Yeah, great at struggling. <laughs> the uh, best at struggling. But I think, yeah, like marrying uh, that to the logistics and, and the actual like work of it, that's something I couldn't have understood. And I've always been a hard worker, um, but I think you get, you get wrapped up in, in the romance of it and, and kind of forget what you're actually trying to do or, or what steps are necessary and important that aren't so romantic to kind of get you to that, that next level. Right. A hundred percent. And, you know, to bring it back to the one year career, you can't make a big, big move without those small steps. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget. It's, it's very easy to forget why you set out to do something and get easily distracted by the millions of things that come up in life that, you know, are this shiny object or, you know, couple that with this whole idea of it's romantic to suffer or to struggle. I mean, I forgot multiple times over the last seven years too. And I mean, I ended up moving to LA with an MBA, like brand new MBA three weeks earlier, I had gotten my MBA and then got on the road to California. And I ended up waiting tables for like two years because it just, you get wrapped up in the day to day and that kind of stuff. And the next thing you know, two years has passed and you're like, wait, didn't I move here to do something? I can't quite remember. Yeah, no, it feels like a, a far off sort of memory and, and you struggle to get that back. Um, and I think for me now, you know, it's a matter of sort of remembering every day, not to the point where I have it like taped up on my ceiling because I hated when guys did that on the swim. <laughs> Here are my goal times. Like, fuck that. <laughs> I won't curse. Uh, I'll stop cursing. Um, but, but no, I, it's sort of waking up with a, a gentle reminder, like, oh, this is what I'm trying to do. Not to the point that you're beating yourself up about it. But, but keeping it front and center is completely center. necessary. Yeah. I mean, think of all the other things we keep front and center that have nothing to do with, you know, progressing through life in a, in a great way. Like we have social media in front of us literally all day, every day. Mm -hmm. And that stuff is easy to cloud our perspective on what the hell we're actually doing here. So to some extent, I mean, I do keep things in front of me. I have a, a clipboard that I hang next to my desk that has my, you know, yearly big goals. And it's not something I stare at every day, but even if it's just in my periphery, it's there and it yeah. keeps me on track for when I'm having days where I'm like, what am I doing again? What is this? And then I'll be like, oh, right. Okay. Let me just do one little thing that would get me closer to those big things. Yeah. So, so talk me through that. So you get to LA. Mm -hmm. What was your first job when you got to LA? Uh, my very first job was reading and evaluating scripts for a uh, writing contest called Fresh Voices the voices of which were not so fresh. Um, but I was paid $10 a script. So that included reading somewhere between like 100 and 120 page script, uh, evaluating it according to different rubrics, like, uh, you know, what do we think of the tone? What do we think of its characters, of its plot? And sort of breaking it down, um, in my estimation, in a way that is like antithetical to actual good work. But that would usually take me somewhere in the neighborhood of like four to five hours. So I was making $2 an hour for this Yay. strenuous work. And I was probably putting in way more work than they were expecting. Of I a hundred percent can back that up. I'm yeah. sure. Of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the writing community in, in Hollywood is founded on like a, a snake oil salesman sort of mentality, at least in those contests. Uh, I'm not afraid to call out fresh voices. Um, <laughs> that's the only specific name I will use today. But from there I worked at a bakery in Century City called Clementine, which was delightful, uh, but I don't think that I was equipped for it. Um, I'm a generally way? affable, congenial guy, but I, I think that I struggled to maintain a sort of, uh, you know how Disneyland, the expectation is that you smile, you're just like up or you're up and you're chipper and you're just like, what can I get you? Like, I'm so excited to take your order. <laughs> and I, I couldn't summon that. Uh, I made, you know, I didn't make enemies. I only lasted there, I think, three months. And they, they politely said they would not be continuing my- <laughs> You got fired from employment. I got fired, yeah. That was, that was the first job I'd gotten fired from. And that, you can imagine, for a Columbia graduate with a yeah. film studies and creative writing I'm degree- you're still you slap in the face. Yeah. Yeah, no, that could have been enough to send me home right then and there, but, but I persevered. Uh, and so that began, let's say, five years of- just kind of odd jobs. And they, and they built, in estimation, there was a stretch where I was working for um, Fox on different sort of digital projects. I was writing the website for American Idol. How did you get that? How did I get that? Um, How did you get the first job? 
the the fresh voices job uh through a friend so okay. actually this is a good segue toward uh you know how things happen and sort of uh exciting things falling into place i was fortunate very fortunate and not everybody is kind of moving out to los angeles hollywood to have at least like a built-in network of friends and, and people I went to school with or that I'd known for a while who, you know, are kind of looking out for one another. And even if it's something as, as stupid as script coverage for the Fresh Voices competition, it's an olive branch and it, it means something, you know, that they would kind It's of a door out. open. Yeah. It's a door open, for sure. That's the whole point in your network. Yeah. And I think that uh, an openness to that, no matter how kind of crappy the job may be, that that is sort of the difference maker, not just for, for my field, but I, I believe for any field, you know, so that Being has- willing to take a job that you maybe feel like, all right, well, this obviously isn't the end game, but it's part of the process to get. Yeah, it's going to mean something. And, and, and uh, you can't know kind of in the moment what it's going to mean. If everybody knew, then we would all be jumping at these opportunities, but you- Yeah, we'd all have shitty jobs happily. Yeah. No, completely. And I think everybody would be a lot more mentally healthy. But, but after the fact, you start to understand, oh, this may not have led to anything specific, but it, it imbued in me, you know, this ability to evaluate this script and meeting this person, you know, opened my eyes to some other way of, uh, of writing or, you know, this, this job, all kinds of sort of an open mind, I think, has been kind of paramount. When you don't know what you don't know, especially, when, you, exactly. especially yeah. when you're just getting out of college, you, I feel like we all have probably like a hundred jobs in our minds that we could name. Like I can think of a hundred jobs. And in reality, there's who even knows how many different types of jobs there are in this world. Mm -hmm. You just don't know till you start down that path. And then you're like, Oh, I didn't even know that that was a thing I could do. Right. So it just helps you see that. And you get, you get a sort of myopic, view of it when you are a writer, when you're an actor, when you're a director, when you, when you have these like beeline ideas as to what your future looks like. And I still want that. I mean, I want to be a professional television writer, professional screenwriter, somebody who just writes. That is my job. That is what I do. And I think that I'm within striking distance of that. But I, at, especially at the beginning, a willingness to sort of keep that on the back burner while cultivating a, a kind of bevy of skills and experiences en route to that, that's huge. And, and that, that's been, I think for me, the primary challenge, but you know, the, the important sort of career moves that I've made, again, only in the last really two years, I would chalk 100% up to friendships that I cultivated, um, experiences that I had that I didn't know at the time would mean anything, but now, you know, it, you, you kind of piece it together in hindsight. It's like the end of usual suspects and suddenly you realize, oh my God, you know, the clues were there the entire time. Yeah, no, I mean, that's... Not to promote a Kevin Spacey movie. <laughs> How dare you? No, um, no, that's one of the things that I think we all forget is that you're not going to be able to see how everything fit together till it's over. So mm -hmm. this obsession with figuring out what to do with your life and making all the right moves is really, it's ridiculous. It's yeah. not even something you're it's able paralyzing. to... paralyzing. It is. It can be. And I think that's where the procrastination piece comes in where you're like, well, I don't know the exact next thing I'm supposed to do. So I'll do nothing and I'll mm -hmm. wait until I figure it out. Yeah. And that's just, that's bullshit. That's, that is procrastination at its finest when instead the right move is just make a move, like just yeah. make a move that you believe is in the general direction of where you want to go. And for you, that was fresh voices first. And then the Fox gig, which I feel like you, you didn't fall into that because I think that diminishes the hard work too. When people say, oh, I don't know. And then here I am. I ended up mm -hmm. here. It's like, you didn't just end up there. You didn't just fall into it. There was intentional moves and struggles. And even if it meant just meeting people and yeah. telling people around you why you were here, that's the other thing people forget is when you take these survival jobs, as you call them, which I like, um, sometimes you forget to let other people know like what your real purpose is. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to fall into it and be like, well, I'm a barista, I'm a waitress, I'm a whatever. Yeah. In reality, no, that's how you're making money today. That right. isn't who you are. That isn't what you do. It's how you're surviving while you are getting closer to the thing that you ultimately want to do. And if you forget that, you'll forget to tell people that. And if people don't realize like, oh, hitting that guy that gets me my croissant every morning, like he's actually trying to be a writer. I know somebody on this show you know, it's never underestimate the power of a small connection, being willing to just 
connect a dot for you and push mm -hmm. you again in that right direction. But you got to let people know. Right. No, it's a matter of self-identification. And I think that that can be difficult for otherwise, you know, humble people or, or people who hesitate to sort of like announce themselves. We live in a city that is very uh, bombastic and very branded and everybody, you know, needs to kind of shout from the, the mountaintop who they are and what they want to do. And it's easy to really rise at that. But, but like you said, it's, it's paramount, you know, is self-identifying every day so that somebody else can see you that way. Nobody else is going to see you the way you want to be seen if you don't sort of articulate in some way. I mean, if you're lucky, somebody will see something in you, but that's such a you can't rare bank on that. Thing. And, and that's the trap, I think, of idealism and romance is imagining that, oh, you know, all the need, I just need to write something good and it's going to fall into somebody's hands and they're going to do the work for me. It's like, I, I myself am uncomfortable with self-promotion and kind of tooting my own horn. It's something I've always struggled with. But the more I get into it and I see people, you know, writers who are successful, I mean, I don't think that's the foundation of their success. I think they are yeah. fundamentally good writers who happen to also uh, be good at sort of navigating the marketplace. But, but a, a certain willingness to, to do that and say, hey, yeah, like puff yourself up a little bit. Like I can do this. Well, I'm you got you to gotta figure other people are doing that. And exactly. you can only take seeing somebody who you know is less talented than yourself get past you so many mm -hmm. times before you're like, okay, fine. I need to get on board with this. Like I need to put myself more out there and at least let the world know what I'm trying to do. And I mean, I think that's one of the beautiful things and fortunate things about living in this age is that people have very short attention spans. So to, even if you were going to reinvent yourself, say, not that I've done that a hundred million times in the last 10 years, but it's very easy to become known as something in a short period of time. Yeah. So that's not to say that you should be like, well, I'm this kind of expert now because that shit drives me crazy. But if you're a writer, you need to own that to an extent. If you're anything, it doesn't really matter whatever it is that you're trying to become more of. Say you're in the very early stages of a career path and you're still a temp or you're an intern or you're you know, a, a receptionist, whatever it is, you need to project who you are trying to be. It's like, you know, dress for the job you want, not the one you have. It's the same with titles. It's the same with letting people know who you are so that they can box you in their brain as that kind of person. That's, I mean, I've started introducing myself as Oscar winner Henning Fogue, hoping that Perfect. that's a sort of seeps yeah. in. I mean, manifest eventually. it, man. Just manifest, manifest it. the yeah, shit I've, out of that. I've never read The Secret, but I think that that's like chapter three. You're dead on. I've read it plenty for both okay. of us. All yeah. Right. No, you're good. I mean, good. we can hang up now. You should just go get ready to get a phone call for your Oscar any second now. Yeah. No, and you can obviously promote this as my chat with Oscar winner Henning Fogue. I absolutely will. Yeah. I mean, future Oscar winner. It's there. No, no, no. Forget about the future part. It's just, it's, it's happened. <laughs> just straight up. It's happened. Yeah. In some dimension somewhere. It it's is called hard. gaslighting. Our president does it and I do it too. Fuck it. Let's get yeah. on board. <laughs> okay. So you have the Fox job now. Mm -hmm. These years from like 2012 to roughly 2015, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like you had, you were, you were coming, you had a lot of near misses or almost theirs with different jobs within the industry, not even almost there or near misses. They were jobs within the industry. They just mm -hmm. weren't quite what you wanted them to be yet. But yeah. again, they were those like, you were super close. So tell us about like how you bounced around a little bit there. Yeah. I mean, here's what I'll say. The, the nature of the television industry is such that there is a sort of clear demarcation between reality programming, which is what I was working in, and scripted programming, which is where I am now. And so to a certain extent, I think that the jobs that I had at American Idol, Utopia, you know, these sort of Fox digital jobs were, were great and instructive and connected me with people, but in some ways, maybe like the ultimate form of procrastination, because on the surface, I had convinced myself, oh, I'm doing something in entertainment and I'm being paid exceptionally well, you know, to write articles about who Aretha Franklin is for, <laughs> you know, people on the American Idol website. Um, so I think that there was like some high level kind of mental judo that I was doing. Um, but I mean, near miss in the sense that, um, yeah, maybe that could have been something. And, and there's a chance that I sort of, not sabotage, but like stop short in those jobs, knowing that I didn't want to go down that path. And so I think, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, there's, there's a willingness to try things and I'm certainly glad that I did those on the other for, for television writing, there is a certain kind of 
um, identification that you need to do with the trajectory that you're on and whether that is going to push you where you want to go. At the end of the day, all writing is writing and it's all instructive and important. But, but I think I, I finished up, I had opportunities there. Then I became a barista. So I, it's always a two step forward, three steps back kind of <laughs> it feels that way. in my history. And that was the last job that I had before finally landing this latest thing at the unnamed uh, sitcom, network sitcom. Um, and that only happened two years ago. And that was a complete kind of fall into my lap. I can't believe you've been there two years. I can't either. It's, wow. It doesn't seem that long. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. The time is flying so much. I think it's out. good. I mean, yeah. it's because, you know, when you were unhappiest, when both of us have been unhappiest, time drags. Slows to a crawl. Oh, yeah. Oh, it yeah. felt like an eternity. I mean, when you, I think there's a moment where you don't realize you're so unhappy and mm -hmm. you are in that high level procrastination zone of yeah. like, well, I'm doing something. Right. And then when you become aware of it, between the awareness and the change towards something better and closer are the hardest, hardest zones. Oh, yeah. Those are the like, you know, mild depression zones where you're like, I know that this isn't doing anything to help me in my career mm -hmm. and yet I'm still here and I don't have a next move. Yeah. That, those moments are hard. Yeah. And I think, and, uh, you know, you and I have had jobs of varying sort of, uh, financial compensation over the years all over the place <laughs> it's and it's funny like i've had jobs that i have worked so little at that have paid me extraordinarily well i've had jobs that i busted my ass for that paid me next to nothing and you start to realize that there's sometimes no correlation between the two that there is a certain randomness to it and so i think when you grow up you know in a um in sort of cause and effect world you know where you work hard and you get reward you get rewarded you know based on that um right. i still believe that i think that that's imperative toward achieving anything but i coming out here especially and sort of understanding that your very like type a uh categorical approach to things doesn't fly anymore i mean i i was yeah. <laughs> a straight a high schooler you know 15 40 sats i go to a great school and none of it matters. And I, I say that without disappointment now, because it, I understand that life is far richer than just like this series of, of narrowly defined steps. But I don't know, I think, I think it can be difficult sort of um, adjusting to random reality when you've been rewarded for so long doing things a certain way. And I think that that's something that unites the two of us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we both got a many hard lessons in X hard work does not equal Y outcome, you know, yeah. and I think that's a really good lesson. And I'm so thankful that I learned it, you know, not in my fifties because yeah. that's even worse. I'm glad it happened early on, but it is difficult. Um, but I think something that, you know, you've always been good at is you never let yourself coast too long. Like even in those moments, like with the Fox jobs, which, you know, you can look at that in one of two ways. Like, yes, you were writing. You were on TV. You were like, you were credited. I'm sure. Weren't you credited maybe in the shows? Uh, I forget. Uh, you, did you, you ever watch the credits? You pooed poo that immediately. Like I watched, I watched like, the show oh, that I work on now the other night with my parents and they were so excited to see my name in the credits. I'm like, I don't care. Whatever. You know, <laughs> Cause credits so, also don't yeah, equal. Act, act like you've been, act like you've been there before. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, I think even in those times when like the Fox jobs, you were checking off boxes. You were in the mm -hmm. industry. You were making good money, more yeah. than you had been making for something that didn't have to do with what It's very attractive. There's a certain kind of golden handcuff component right. to it. But you also knew that if you were ever going to get to the place that you thought you wanted to get to, writing on a sitcom on network television, that wasn't going to get you there. Oh, yeah. However, that's not to say that, like you said, the people you met and the experiences you gained those are totally valuable things that added to your tool belt, you know, of experiences and knowledge. However, to get on that next path, you knew you had to switch gears. So you mm -hmm. took the, you got rid of those jobs. You went back to barista-ing. Is that mm -hmm. the word? What? Yeah, sure. That sounds great. Yeah. And, and what happened from then? Because I also want to talk about like throughout this whole time, you were still writing on the side, yeah. sometimes more than others. Uh-huh written a number of spec scripts, which what is a spec script for those? Speculative people? script that you write without, I mean, basically at this point, it just means something that you write without getting paid for, which I'm very well versed in. <laughs> um, 
but but writing sort of existing episodes uh, or writing sample episodes of existing shows and or writing brand new pilots, you know, the first episode of a series for yourself. So any writer that's been out here for a while has accumulated, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of like five to 10 spec scripts that constitute your portfolio that, uh, you know, ideally you share with people. You don't just keep them in a shoebox. I was going to say, do they actually serve a purpose? So let's, let's say that somebody is listening who is an aspiring television show writer. Yeah. I guess what, what are your kind of overall like steps that you've taken up until this point? So you went to school for it, but we all know mm -hmm. you don't really have to do that, which mm -hmm. is okay. Yep. You got the artsy shit down. Mm -hmm. Came out here, you started getting some jobs where you were reviewing scripts, yep. providing feedback, um, and then writing these, you know, social media posts and recaps and things like that. Like, would you say that those are all kind of steps along the process to ultimately being a TV show writer, or they just happen to be one? Oh no, up? none of them are. Um, <laughs> I think. Here's what I think. Uh, you've got you've got the professional side of things, and you've got the creative side of things. Um, what I have been doing lately is really digging into the professional side. In the last two years, I've been a line producer's assistant, a showrunner's assistant, and now a writer's assistant, which is in the hierarchy of writing rooms, one rung below being a staff writer. And there's no guarantee that that happens, you know? And I, I do, part of me still bristles at the idea that like, you can just work hard enough and get to that point. Like it should be founded on creative accomplishment. It should mean something beyond just, oh, I stuck around long enough. Um, well, do you feel like it's a combination of those two things? It's a combination. That's also a voice in my head that's a bullshit voice, which, you know, I need to stifle that. But um, on the creative end, I think all of those experiences, you know, uh, the dog walking, the tutoring, the baristaing, the recapping, all of it has been hugely important. And I think makes me, um, I don't know, the, the writer and sort of person that I am today. And that might sound trite, but I, I believe that in the realm of writing, you got to have stuff to write about. You have to have experience. True. You have all these character studies that were these wonderful character studies, you know, with, with names that I cannot mention on this, this <laughs> podcast. But, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. And maybe that's easy sort of after the fact justification for like, oh, like, of course I needed to spend six months being a tutor in Hawaii. It meant something. Um, I do think it, it did, but I mean, if to well, who answer, cares? But, Every experience doesn't have to feed into your career either. No, it doesn't. Um, and I do think in some ways, left, left unsaid in everything that, that we've gotten through so far is the luck component to television writing. I am deeply fortunate to have been on a show that has lasted as long as it did. I, I was put on a pilot. So, I mean, maybe we should talk about sort of- Yeah, how'd pivot, you get there? Right? You called yeah. the pivot. Um, I was working as a barista at a place in Santa Monica and got a call from a completely random producer on an upcoming network sitcom pilot. She had gotten my name through a friend of mine that I had been in a writer's group with and who I had sort of offered extensive notes in mm -hmm. the, that maybe like a, a year and a half before that time. And so, you know, talking about sort of these, these happenstance moments, these random encounters, these things that you can't understand their import until later, when it starts to kind of blossom, it's like the reason that I got this phone call was because I was in this writer's group. The reason I got, you know, uh, recommended was because I had developed a friendship and a sort of creative bond with this person. That is the thing that mattered the most when it came mm -hmm. to finally getting this thing, which, you know, I, I like to think fell into my lap, but in a more sort of cosmic sense, you know, the, the seeds been planted and I had done the work to kind of allow that to happen, I guess. Nothing uh, falls in anybody's lap, no matter how much, even if the person thinks that that's what's happened, I think they're mm -hmm. doing a major disservice to all of their hard work throughout the years and the people that they've connected with and who have helped them. I think when you forget about those very specific strategic elements, you leave it so much up to chance. And yeah, of course, there's, there's a bit of chance involved with everything, but while you can acknowledge that chance, you still have to do the work day in and day out and then be ready for that chance to just come to you, yeah. right? So it's like hard work yeah, plus luck. Sure. Um, but I, I do still think beyond that, you know, and I, I, there is a degree of luck to getting me there. Competence and hard work and, you know, a generally affable demeanor have kept me there for the last year and a half, two years. But there is luck on the sort of practical side of it where it's like, this is a pilot that got picked up. 
then it got a back nine for season one then it got a renewal for season two and all signs point to it being renewed for a season three so me sort of climbing the ranks at that job are predicated on forces well outside my control so i think in hindsight i you know i'm 31 years old i am one year removed from when my parents had me which is something that doesn't ever weigh on my mind at all um, Please, I'm six years past when my mom had me, so yeah, and it. rapidly losing her fertility. Uh, <laughs> so, sorry, it's a different episode, honey. Different episode. All right, that'll be a two-parter. We'll talk about babies. Um, only, only my fake brother could get away with saying crap like that. Yeah, that's that's true. That's one of the perks. Hmm. Uh, what was I saying? Luck. Um, the show getting picked up. And yeah, oh, the show getting picked up. Um, so I'm very fortunate that like the opportunity potentially exists to sort of make that leap and the leap being writer's assistant to staff writer. A lot of buddies of mine, you know, some of whom are still working and pursuing others of whom kind of fell by the wayside. They, they left Los Angeles or they're doing something completely different now had different breaks, you know, along the way. I knew a guy that was a script coordinator, you know, which is another sort of staff, uh, support staff position on five different shows and never had the chance to kind of, you know, show, show what he could do in any of those moments or people that flit around They're they're a PA on this show, or they're like a casting associate on this show. And, and all that, you know, I do believe is important, but one of the ways that I sort of forgive myself for taking a little longer to get started is that I could just as easily be at the exact same place that I am now. Had I, you know, really begun in earnest this sort of professional, journey at the age of 25, 26, you know, as is, I was 29 years old before really saying like, okay, I need to pursue the professional track. So what made that happen? Uh, this falling into my lap. Th- that is the God's truth. I would have so you got the call and you're like, I got the call. Okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah, Let's and, get real. Yeah. In the, in the, the most poetic way possible. I also got a call that day from my contacts at Fox who were like, we're going to do another season of American Idol. We want you to be, this was the final Fox season. It will be premiering on ABC sometime in January. I don't work for them anymore. I don't know why I'm promoting it right now, (laughs) Um, but that job would have paid me, I think two and a half times as much as I was making and continue to make uh, at this network sitcom. So, that, I mean, that was a moment. That was a sort of like two roads diverge where I, I could have definitely been more financially comfortable. American Idol, you know, would have been canceled, but I would have found my way onto something else. Um, or I can suck up, you know, this sort of financial loss and really go for it for genuinely, you know, the first time. Um, so I think that was the moment, so to That's speak. That's definitely huge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, turning down more money in the short term for the hope of a long-term gain is right. something that most of us are pretty bad at. No, and I, I mean, it, it was not, it, it honestly was not a super hard decision. I, I feel like I, I feel like I'd been waiting for that. And this is something, you know, this is, this is specific to me and sort of that, that idealism and romance. I wanted it to happen and it kind of did happen. Ultimately, I didn't need to be the one to like put myself forward and say like, I mean, I had to interview and I had to prove myself, but it wasn't a matter of like going on the tracking board. It wasn't a matter of they came to you. It came to me and I didn't send out, you know, mass emails to friends, which is something anybody pursuing a career in entertainment is familiar with. And you feel like embarrassed and you, you feel a sense of, of kind of low level shame to be like supplicating, you know, before people I'm like, Hey, if you guys have like a catering job, you know, you need, or like, if you just want someone to like carry your pens around, <laughs> I can totally do that. But, but I think that you do have to sort of offer yourself that way um, to keep, to keep climbing. No, I think you're totally right. And just kind of to wrap up this, cause I feel like this is like phase one, right? This whole, mm-hmm. that, five years from moving to LA to getting that call is definitely phase one of, of your career. And you Mm -hmm. had a lot of different spokes on that wheel as did I during that time. But I think, you know, in retrospect, it is really easy to say, well, yeah, it all made sense. It was all worth it. Like if you could say something to the Henning that drove across country Mm -hmm. in his burnt, what, what color? Burnt umber. umber. Like, you know, if you, if you could, not that he would listen to you because we both know. No, he, fuck no, he wouldn't listen. Nor would Bailey of 2010. But yeah. 
if you could give one bit of advice on like knowing that it was going to be five full years of ups yeah. and downs and two steps forward, three steps back, mm -hmm. what do you think you'd say? All right. So we're assuming a level of predestination in this, that the future was written a certain way. And I guess it's sure. like the Terminator timeline. It's going to yeah. judgment day is going to happen whether you no want it to. What. Or not. Yeah. Okay. But he still I, has to put in all that hard work. He's still going to put in the work. I think that what I would say to 24 year old Henning, a little spryer, um, you know, <laughs> hey, I'm very fortunate that my hair is what it is. But um, <laughs> what I would say to him is the, Idealism and the romance are hugely important. And in many ways, they are your truth. And they are, you know, something that is going to kind of resuscitate you in down moments. But that is not the whole picture. You can't build a life around a feeling. You can sort of start from that point. But you also need to wed that to tangible hard work. And you need to marry that to the sort of like unsexy reality of just working your ass off. and and committing every day to this thing that like you're reminded of when you watch an episode of the office or Friday night lights or the OC. Those are sort of like my founding myth stories, but makes yeah, perfect sense. Re yeah, completely re like reinforcing that, you know, there is, there is a lot of unsexy work that goes into, you know, achieving your dreams or like creating the opportunity for them to flourish. So I think that's what I would say to 24 year old. And I'd say, you know, you take your time getting across the country. Uh, California is going to be what it is. It's going to enter a drought in a couple of years. So, you know, prepare <laughs> for that. Um, I think I would also recommend that he get into mindfulness meditation and be like, this oh. thing's going like, to be hugely important to you in a few years. So just like get a jump start on it now. So is that something you do now? Uh, I attempt to. I, I still struggle with sitting down and like stopping myself for even a 10 minute period. But I do think that, I don't know, especially for anybody that, that has lofty ambitions and sort of an idea in their head as to what their future looks like or who they are, I, like reminding yourself that none of that is possible without sort of dealing with the here and now, which is all that we ever have. Uh, yeah, I think, especially for very go, go, go kind of animated people, it, it can be an absolute lifesaver. So, so today I'm going to be plugging mindfulness meditation <laughs> just as a practice. Out? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the Calm app on your phone, iPhone or Android is hugely uh, beneficial. Is that what you use? Oh, yeah. 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 No, I, if we are, yeah, I'll plug it. Calm. Download it. It's great. Hey, I'm a big fan of tools and, you know, things that help people be better versions of themselves or calmer versions. Like, mm -hmm. trust, I have, I have, you know, I love my apps and my, my technology. Oh, yeah. No, I, uh, I, I would highly recommend it to anybody. If you see any of yourself in me or my story, if you're looking at me right now thinking like, that looks like an agitated guy like me. <laughs> then no, and this is such a calmer, more at peace version of you. I think we've both, I know, I mean, that's saying a lot, right? Uh -huh. But like, I think we've both mellowed significantly in the last seven years right. without losing our edge. Yeah. But you, ha you do have to realize, I think as a recovering type A, which I am, I think I'm like a B plus now. Okay. Um, you realize, you know, everything we've been talking about this whole time about like coming in with expectations and thinking you can control things and that X equals Y, you just start to realize the more you go on through life, like, well, those foundations are very helpful for remaining grounded and having, um, having a plan, right? Mm -hmm. Plans are really helpful, but they aren't everything. They're just your baseline. They're your structure. The good stuff happens in the unplanned moments and in the serendipity. And my mom always used to tell me, leave a little room for serendipity, Bailey. Don't be so, you know, checkbox heavy. And I'm like, shut up, mom. What do you know? You know nothing. I would have said and the same like, thing to, to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. TD, stop. But no, she's totally like, right. Are you, are you a sole barista? Leave a little room? <laughs> Give me a break. Exactly. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, when you, when you have a plan and then you allow for the variables to happen as they're going to, whether you allow them to or not, right. yeah. it makes it a lot easier to be flexible and to be able to move through life in a way that doesn't feel like you're breaking every time things don't go according to plan. Yeah. You know, so... I think that's important for both of us. And 
I imagine anybody listening who also considers themselves a highly ambitious type A individual, never lose that because that is what sets you apart from people that aren't that way. Right, However, but you also have to live day to day. And you, you gotta have, live. You have to deal with yourself. So right, and let me tell you, dealing with an ongoing type A, you know, box checking freak mm -hmm. every day of your life gets exhausting fast. Oh yeah. So just fucking relax, you guys. Yeah, find, find your way to deal with yourself. <laughs> So any final thoughts? I mean, so what's next? So you're, you're a writer's assistant. Ideally, that means... Yeah, we haven't really talked about what that actually yeah, means. So what does in that brief, actually being mean? a writer's assistant on a network sitcom entails taking copious notes, sort of figuring out the flow of conversation in the room, what is important to an upcoming story, what can sort of be pushed aside. Um, yeah, and, and crafting the story as the writers go along, which in and of itself is an education. It's just sort of learning the, I don't know, to a certain extent, the math of building a story. Mm. So that, that's sort of the, the day in, day out. And we work for maybe 10 to 12 people. I'm one of two writer's assistants. One of us will be in the quote unquote B room, sort of working on jokes and alt pitches, you know, to stories. Somebody else is with the executive producers and refining scripts, um, talking through future episodes, stuff like that. So next step, you know, is making the leap from staff, from writer's assistant to staff writer, which happened uh, last year with the former writer's assistant. He had been working, I think, for four or five years at a different show and was like demonstrably worthy of being promoted. I'm not sure that I'm there yet. I, if I had to sort of like put a timeline to it, I think it, it's probably like a year and a half away, which... A previous version of me would be very frustrated with and say, what the shit, you kidding me? I'm going to go be a barista again. That'll show you. Um, and, and I have to fight that voice in my head because I know that this is a great opportunity and that there is some degree of like, not safety, because nothing is safe or stable under heaven. We both know this. Um, but that within that year, you know, I can write some really good stuff. And I can, you know, learn more at this job. And so it feels less like a sort of burden than it does an opportunity. Um, what are you missing? What do you think, like, what steps do you need to take between now and then to be able to be ready for it? Uh, I mean, I think it's really just for my own sort of spiritual uh, wholeness. I need to just keep writing because I, I, I want to feel ready for that job. And that is sort of, that's a me thing as opposed to a job thing. Um, so you think just I, more experience? Yeah, more experience and, and a sort of continued growing comfort with um, my own writing, with the kind of writing that I would do on the show. Um, yeah, just it, it's uh, re continuing to reconcile the professional with the creative and sort of understanding how those two can work together, ideally in perfect harmony, but I think it takes a while to kind of get to that point. Well, I feel like you're on a really good path for the professional side and hopefully those two roads converge sooner than later and then I don't okay. have to be a liar when I say Oscar winner Henning folk. <laughs> right, yeah. then you'll just be a truth teller. Exactly. Which is what we aspire to. Absolutely. Well, thanks Henning. Thanks Bailey. This is really great. Bye. Yeah. I'm hoping all of the future Oscar winners out there found this very helpful. And regardless of whether you're a writer or not, I think the truth is still there that a lot of, you know, a lot of it is hard work, but so mm -hmm. much of it too is being flexible and being willing to take the jobs that you're not hundred percent sure are going to get you where you want to go, make those connections, never, never assume that you know how something's going to work out and you know, we all hope we're going to get that random call that falls in our lap that had nothing to do with all of that hard work and, you know, connecting that we've done years if past. If you take nothing else away from this conversation, wait around for a phone call. <laughs> that's, that's the best advice I could offer any aspiring writer or frankly. Go get any, a barista job and yeah. wait for your phone to yep. ring. Yep. I, it's, yeah. It's very I think, specific. If it could happen for me, it can happen for you too. You've summarized it beautifully. Yep. I feel like I got it. Thanks, Henning. Thanks, Bailey. Bye, guys. Oops.